It is 9.03. It is Friday night. It is time for Dino 101. You guys, thank you so much for being here. If this is your first time, sincerely, thank you for coming. If this is not your first time, welcome back, you fucking weirdos. Tonight, we are joined by the illustrious Aaron Ryan. We're going to talk all about some of the most unfuckwithable people in the history of politics and paleontology. In order to do that, I need to bring on my co-hosts of the most, the Lisa to my Bart. That works. All right, that one works. Uh, who's coming out of her cave and she's been doing just fine. Christina Gustavich. <laughs> Christina, you have some very important rules for the evening, don't you? I sure do. Uh, welcome, welcome to a Zoom. I'll tell you how it works just in case. One year in, this is your first time on Zoom. We are recording tonight. We'd love to see your face, but if you don't want your face to be part of that, that's cool. Uh, just click the stop video button down there. Uh, another down there thing that we love uh, is the chat. Yeah, it's it's there, uh, Abajo. The chat. Uh, send us questions as we go today. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. We do have a designated Q&A time at the end or just respond and react to what's going on. Uh, we'll see you there. Now it's time for the fun rules. Uh, as with everything else tonight, this is as participatory as you want it to be. We invite you to imbibe with us when you hear these words. Uh, because birds are dinosaurs, if you hear anything about a bird, you will take a sip. If anybody, including your friends in the chat, make a dad joke that makes you groan, you'll take a sip. Finally, it is our month to celebrate our history, ladies. So if you hear the word history, history, you'll take a sip. You just said it three times, so I'll get the I ball. I sure did. This is the most fun fake class on Friday nights. And just like any class, we should take attendance. Uh, we're really curious to know how many times have you guys been to Dino 101? Is this your first time, baby? Let's go. Two to five, six to 10. Or your life and Dino One have just blended into one thing at this point. We got a lot of newbies. OK. We love to see it. We love to see it. Love to see it. A lot of old timers as well. Someone in the chat already said, I'm going to need a bigger alcohol. That is true. Please pace yourself. All right. I'm going to share this poll because some people are curious. Some people want to know. Welcome. Another uh, relatively <laughs> uh, bimodal distribution. We have 15 first timers tonight. Welcome. Please stay. Uh, as well, 38 of you welcome way back. Uh, and those of you in the middle, of course, as well. Love to see it. So for those of you that have been here, you know what we have to do first. For those of you who have not, I will introduce it right now. Every single Dino 101, we have a Dino of the day that we task you, should you choose to, uh, draw, watercolor, digitally render, ink and paper, whatever your medium is, we task you to draw this. And at the end of our time together, we'll go around the Zoom. Everyone will hold up their tremendous paleo art renderings. Tonight's dinosaur of the day is actually not a dinosaur. It is a marine reptile. reptile. It is a plesiosaur because you guys know we have to talk about Mary Annie tonight. We'll get there in a little bit. The dino of the day tonight is a plesiosaur. And because it's getting warmer out and we can't wait to be outside interacting with people, maybe at the beach, you need to render plesiosaurus your, yourself at the beach with a plesiosaurus. Now, you can be finding a plesiosaurus fossil. You can be frolicking in the wake with plesiosaurus. Whatever you want to do, you need to be at the beach with plesiosaurus. And this right here is an example of a plesiosaur. I don't want to spoil too much. We'll talk about these guys in a little bit. All right, that is your dino of the day. You're not dino. You're marine reptile of the day. All right, without further ado, you know her from Jezebel. You know her from Crooked Media. I know her as probably my favorite person on Twitter. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Ryan. Airhorn? Hi. Aaron, can you get the airhorn again? Airhorn? <laughs> Aaron, you're in LA. You're not yeah. drinking, but you have the best shirt on in the room, probably. Can you show us? Again? Yeah, I can. It's Dolly Parton. It's a sweatshirt of her face, and then also her sitting with her guitar and her signature, just so that people know in case there's any doubt that these are two Dolly Partons. She endorses. Like, <laughs> like, I think we should bring that back for sure. Yeah, totally. All right, Aaron, before we get into these unfuck withables, we have to put you through the test we put every guesswork through. And okay. that is everyone's favorite game, dino or not a dino. Here's how this is going to work. I have right here a list of 10 different animals, some of which are real actual dinosaurs, some of which we have totally made up. Your job is to discern the real dinosaurs from the fake ones. If you need help, people in the chat are 
usually marginally helpful. Um, there is a theme for the not dinosaurs as well. If you can figure that out, that's extra bonus points. And if you need a spelling at any point, I'm happy to spell any of these. Okay. When was the last time you took a test this stressful? Mm, probably when I had to try to get my California driver's license after not having a driver's license for 10 years and just having to print out a thing from the state of Wisconsin that was like, she drove at one point and answered two questions that were like, what is a stop sign? And then they handed me my driver's license. That's how hard it is to get your license in California. I recommend it, guys. <laughs> I just need to hand you a piece of paper. It's like draw a stop sign. Awesome. <laughs> what do you do if you see a child in the road? I swear to God, this was one of the questions. What do you do when you see a child in the road? And one of them was like, honk, they'll get out of the way, <laughs> which was not the right answer. <laughs> it's like, never mind. I was gonna make a bad job. All right, enough of this. Diner, not a diner. Here we go. 10 animals. Animal number one Macornithorops. Macornithorops. I, th I don't think that's real. That's not real. That is correct. That is not real. You are one for one. Great start. I appreciate the confidence you came with for question number one. Question number two, Stenopelix. Stenopelix? Stenopelix? I'm not really sure. I don't think that's real either. I see some friends in the chat who are saying, oh, what's oh well, here, wait, let me use my lifeline. Okay, I'm going to say, yeah, I, I think it's real. I'm going to agree with Stacy, Carol, and M. It's, it's real. good that you went to the chat. You're two for two. Uh, I want you to do well. Quick sidebar, I did a dinosaur trivia last night with the museum, and I had the director of the museum play, and he did the worst that anyone's ever done in this game. You're doing great, though. Animal number three, D. Dodopus. D. Dodopus. Oh, that's not a dinosaur. That is also not a dinosaur. Wow, three for three. Next, Aurora Ceratops. That's a dinosaur. That is, wow. That is, a, you were four for four. Animal number five, Archaeoceratops. Hmm, yes. Five for five. All you do is win, 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 no matter what. <laughs> Next, Denisuchus. That's not a dinosaur. I know what this is. Okay. I know what you guys are doing. <laughs> Six out of six. All right. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, Yamaceratops. Yes, it's a dinosaur. That, all right. Yes, that is a dinosaur. Do you, or, you know, I'm just keep going. Magnarostris. That's not a dinosaur. That is a dinosaur. All right. It is. Ah. Magnarostris is an actual dinosaur. Uh, you are currently, you've gotten eight out of nine to go 90%. Last but not least, Proto McPoyle. Not a dinosaur. <laughs> So uh, you and many people in the chat have figured out are not dinosaurs, <laughs> all the characters. All right, uh, and just so you know that we weren't totally blowing smoke here, you told me on our phone call that you love Triceratops, is that correct? I do love Triceratops. We've had yeah. Triceratops as our Dino of the Day very recently, so we couldn't do that, but I wanted to introduce you to some of its fam. And since we're talking about history today, this is yeah. basically, well, not the evolutionary history, but these are a lot of close relatives of Triceratops, Ceratopsians. They were a lot smaller and eventually evolved into being the big, big horn, big frilled guys that you recognize, like Cynopelix, Aurora Ceratops, mm. Archaeoceratops, Yamaceratops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want this guy as a pet. Can you imagine? I would feed yammy, yams. Boom. And Magna Rostris, its name just means giant nose. Rude. <laughs> rude. That's so rude. It's, it's parrot-like, like a, you know, like a parakeet or whatever. Well, Triceratops literally has a parrot beak. Like its beak is just, it's bonkers. Yeah, it's, their dinosaurs are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all here. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get into our unfuck with the bulls, uh, we want to do one quick poll. So, Aaron, actually, I'm going to ask you first. You kind of quickly defined in your mind what unfuck with the bull means to you. What mm -hmm. is your like? What's your go-to definition? What do, what do you even mean when we say unfuck with the bull? Um, I think unfuck with the bull means something that has really strong defense. So, at the moment that you fuck with it, you may regret it, okay. um, or it has real strong like revenge or it's really good at preventing you from even fucking with it in the first place. So like it's either a deter, it can like deter you from fucking with it. Uh, it immediately makes you regret fucking with it or upon fucking with it, only discord and sadness will befall you afterward. Okay, okay. 
So Christine and I decided we were going to do a little poll to get us into this. We're talking about the unfuck with balls, but respect, with respect to the greatest cinematic achievement of all time, obviously Jurassic Park, which of these following Jurassic Park characters is most fuck with the Is it Dr. Alan Grant, Dr. Ian Malcolm, Dr. Ellie Sattler, Roger Muldoon, or Mr. DNA? Please vote now. Aaron, you can't vote because you're a co-host, but which one of these do you believe to be the most fuck with the I've never seen Jurassic Park. I'm, I'm Look at the gallery. Look at what you've done to them. <laughs> I've never seen Jurassic Park, guys. It's Not one, yet. It's one All of right. those movies that like I didn't see when it was in theaters. And I've sort of been saving it for like a night when I'm feeling really down and I want to like make it an event by p- popping some popcorn and watching something. Like during pandemic, actually not having seen a lot of popcorn movies has really been a lifesaver. Like I'd never seen Total Recall. Watching that for the first time was a delight. Um, so hopefully between now and when I'm actually vaccinated, I'll be able to watch Jurassic Park. I bet as people start going to movie theaters, I wonder if like, especially outdoor drive-ins are gonna play like classics like that this summer. I feel like going to Jurassic Park on a drive-in would be amazing. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, they're doing that in California. They're, they're doing um, like classic movies in California. On 4th of July last year, my now husband and I went and saw Field of Dreams outside of the Rose Bowl. It was so, yeah, it was like so American. We had like <laughs> star spangled diarrhea afterwards. Um, but yeah, it was really fun. They're doing it in a lot of places in SoCal for sure. Is that the first time you've said the phrase star spangled diarrhea? Yes, yes it is. I just made it up just now. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. We got a lot of unfuck with walls to go to. Um, when I asked you, who did you want to talk to? This first woman is not someone that I even knew a ton about. I think I'd heard about her in passing. So I was surprised, but very excited to hear you want to talk about the one, the only St. Olga of Kiev, who, who Kiev of, by the way, is holding a dinosaur, which is that bird, which is a drink. Yes. So do that to get us started. Aaron, okay. St. So, Olga, Olga of Kiev is a really fun one. Um, I love that her picture kind of looks like, what's it, the Ghostbusters 2 guy, the Carpathian, the mad, ugh, like the haunted painting. All of, all of her pictures. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She looks mad in all of them. And that's because she, before she became a saint, she was most well known for being fucking crazy. Okay, so <laughs> Olga's husband, Igor, was uh, the, the regent of her kingdom. And he was killed in about like 945 AD ish. He tried to collect tribute from uh, the Devilarian people or Derevelian, sorry, Der- Derevelian people. And uh, he tried to collect to hire the normal tribute from them. Uh, they got mad and killed him and they buried him. So um, after that, Olga took power because their son was a toddler and he couldn't become the king. Um, and shortly after the killing, uh, the prince of the uh, Derevelians sent an envoy to Kiev to ask Olga to marry him. Like, you know, let's unite the kingdoms and stuff. And Olga handled it by saying like, "Mm, this is intriguing. I like this idea. Um, Maybe, why don't we celebrate this envoy? Everybody like get in fancy boats and tomorrow you will be carried into the city of Kiev, into the walls and there'll be a celebration for you. And so the next day they do all that. Um, Unbeknownst to the envoy that night before the parade, Um, the citizens of Kiev under Olga's command had dug a huge trench. And so when the boat was carried into Kiev, uh, the people in the boat were tossed into the trench and buried alive. Um, But she was not done because after that, Olga sent a messenger to uh, Prince Mal and she said that she wanted him to send some of his best men to escort her back to the capital of Dereva. And so he sent some warriors And they were like, all right, here we are to take you back so you can marry our king. And she was like, cool, you guys got to shower first, though. I need you guys to to get all cleaned up. So they went into a bathhouse. And as soon as the last man was in there, she had her men seal the doors closed. And she lit the bathhouse on fire and burned them all alive. Then (laughs) Olga was not done. She went to Dereva's capital, um, saying that she wanted to have a funeral for her dead husband. And so they did, they threw like a big like Game of Thrones style funeral with a bunch of people, a bunch of food, a bunch of alcohol. And when everyone was good and drunk, Olga had her troops attack the party and 5,000 
thousand people were killed. Then, then, <laughs> Olga <laughs> marched her armies into Dereva. I know there's there keeps being then because this bitch was crazy. She marched her ar armies into the territory and laid siege to the capital city, and she people were starving. And um, while they were starving, they were like, "We don't have any tribute to pay you." And she's like, "That's fine, guys. All you need to do is every house needs to give me three sparrows and three pigeons." And so all the people were like, "Oh, thank God, she's gonna finally let us." You just said three sparrows and how many pigeons? Three, three. So that's of six birds in total. You don't have to take six drinks, but I think. <laughs> Right. Well, these, these dinosaurs, these bird dinosaurs. Um, so that night, uh, oh, and then she said, you know, but tonight you, all, you guys also have a curfew. So that night, um, Olga had her army tie rags to every single one of the birds and light the rags on fire. And the birds flew back into the city. Everyone was locked in their homes and they were still under siege and the whole city burned everyone in it alive that was her revenge okay so then shortly thereafter this happened around in like the year 945 busy. Maybe, busy. Yeah, right so maybe five years later olga goes to constantinople which is current day istanbul and she converts to christianity and back then christianity wasn't a big deal like it was kind of a secondary religion it was like scientology or mormonism it wasn't like everyone was doing it so she um she converted she went back to kiev and she um, she can eventually it led to the Christianity becoming the uh, official religion of her kingdom. And as a result, after she died, <laughs> the head of the church, it was like an Eastern Orthodox church, made her a saint and not only a saint, but they declared her a saint equal to the apostles, which is something they've only done to five women in history. So the moral of the story is, uh, no matter how many people you burn alive in revenge uh, to avenge the death of your husband, as long as you say you're really sorry and get a bunch of people to convert, you're definitely going to heaven and you're the same as one of Jesus's apostles. So that's the lesson for unfuck with a bull, Olga of Kiev. I, I was raised in the Eastern Orthodox Church and I think uh, my baba, my grandma, uh, gave me those same morals. <laughs> well, I don't want to fuck with you, Christina. Uh, the chat was amazing to watch as you're telling that story. Uh, a, because people are reacting as I my face was, but B, people kept asking questions. Be like, wait, how is she saying? You would answer the questions that people are asking as you were telling. It was great. <laughs> oh yeah, right on cue. And then, and then, <laughs> she doesn't quit. She was like a real, uh, a real Daenerys, a real one. <laughs> real. One. So time period again, remind us about about 945, 950 AD. Okay, so we're going about almost 1000 AD, fast forward to about 1500 AD with Hatshepsut, is that correct? Hatshepsut was BC. Ancient, you know, a lot of people forget about ancient Egypt. They were, they were like, they were like doing math and building obelisks and shit when other people were like, uh, I guess we'll live in a cave. Like ancient Egypt was so far advanced over like so, so many civilizations. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, it's like, it's like if Nickelback performed and then Beyonce performed, like Hatshepsut and ancient Egypt was like the Beyonce of the ancient world. They were so, so ridiculously advanced. Um, do you want me to talk about Hatshepsut? I do. I just realized that like we flipped the order for some reason. Why, Christina, why were we thinking AD for Hatshepsut? That makes zero sense. 1500 AD. What did we, oh, God. Do? I we just, do? What are we, what are we doing? I did the absolute value of these dates. That's, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I was distracted by uh, Hatshepsut's official falcon. That's another drink. According to Wikipedia, this is from her temple, the, her official falcon. Do you know anything about this? Uh, I believe that that is, is that, no. Is, uh, what's, Hor is that Horus or is that Osiris? So according to um, Hatshepsut's Wikipedia page, this image is from her temple and it is her official falcon. Okay, yeah. So the ancient Egyptian, pharaohs the first of all their religion was bananas like there's never really been anything like it and it was an a, like official religion for like five thousand years and it was like the most powerful religion of the most powerful civilization and it's just very very weird um a lot of times pharaohs would have themselves depicted as like the gods that they were supposedly endorsed by like it was sort of like um if i really liked Tom Brady and I was the queen of America 
and I had art of myself all over the place wearing like a Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> I guess that's maybe the equivalent of it. But yeah, they believe themselves to be like actual gods. And uh, that was one of the gods that Hatshepsut believed she was capable of like embodying that you could just switch her. Um, so Hatshepsut was uh, one of history's most uh, famous lady kings. Like she was a woman, but she was depicted as a full-on king. She was like king woman of Egypt. She was the, uh, the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty in Egypt. She was the daughter of a king and she was also married to King Tutmos II. Um, but he died when Tutmos's son, Tutmos III, was only two. So the heir to the throne was technically Tutmos III. Tutmos III was a, was a toddler, kind of similar way that Olga came into power. It's like somebody died and then she uh, took the throne. So she wasn't officially in line for the throne, So she, but she you know, took it anyway. Um, and it's funny because once she took power, she like rewrote a bunch of Egyptian legends that were like, and then the gods were like, this lady's the king <laughs> like so there's all these like different legends of how but historians think that it was her kind of stepping in as regent when really she just kind of took power when it was there so people think that she ruled between 21 and 22 years um she uh was depicted as like in all the pharaoh things in art depicted as a god in art during her reign she did a lot of stuff that's like boring political stuff but actually in terms of being a leader she was really effective she established trade routes that had been disrupted by some wars that the ancient Egyptians were involved in before. Most notably, she uh, started trading with the land of Punt, which is uh, south and east of Egypt. And one of the things that Punt gave them was frankincense, which Hatshepsut would grind into a powder and use as eyeliner. So thank you for the cat eye, Hatshepsut. She basically invented use, using frankincense as eyeliner. Um, she also built a ton of stuff. She built uh, some of the biggest obelisks in the world in Karnak. She uh, also built the temple of Paket. She made up the goddess of Paket. Paket was a combination of two goddesses. In ancient Egyptian, Paket translates to she who scratches, which is amazing, uh, and is like a lioness goddess of war. Um, and she was one of uh, Hatshepsut's favorite. She has a mortuary complex that you guys have probably seen pictures of. It's called Deir el-Bari. And is the one that's like kind of built into a cliff and it's like layers of columns. Um, and it's it's really, really beautiful. It predated the um, the Acropolis by like thousands of it? years. Did I find the right image? Let's see. Is this it? Yes, that is it. That's it. That's it. Yep. Mm -hmm. is zoomed out. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's her entire <laughs> complex. Um, so some of the statuary in there is like incredible. There's a whole Hatshepsut room in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and there's a ton of Hatshepsut um, artifacts in the British Museum in London, and there's also a lot in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, which is they're all just like amazing. Um, the architect that built this was built this was rumored to be her lover, but her lover never had like an official post in uh, in government. He just was sort of her like, and she didn't want to get married because she didn't want to share power. But yeah, he was like a very prolific side piece for Hatshepsut. Um, also, Hatshepsut uh, built Deir el Bari, and because it was so awesome other kings who came after her built their uh built their complexes nearby in the valley of the kings she like invented the valley of the kings um she uh so also you know like i said as art in art she was drawn as a man she died in middle age uh she was one of the most successful rulers of ancient egypt so after she died um tutmos the third took over and he was a really good leader as far as leaders go too he was a great general. He was like a botanist. He was like a man of letters. He was very smart. Um, but toward the end of his reign, as men do, he started trying to take credit for all the shit that she had done. And uh, some people would go into some of the places that she had built and try to chip her likeness out of things. Um, so there are big like Hatshepsut shaped holes in these Egyptian reliefs. Um, so but, so oh, go ahead. No, What's so that? petty. That's just very petty. I know. Well, they, people would do that in like other cultures too, but like also they would try to take credit for things that people would try to take credit for things that she had done. Men would try to take credit for things that she had done. The original version of just a guy repeating what you said in a meeting, but louder and getting credit <laughs> for it. Um, and but you know, so in the in the in the 18th and 19th century, or in the 19th and 20th century, in er, early Egyptology, there was a lot of confusion about like, well, who built this? Like, who is this lady? And uh, the more they figured out about Hatshepsut, the more they realized that she was one of the most like impressive leaders 
in history. So, and I, I really hope that there is some sort of curse associated with her mummy and that there's something that's, that's really, uh, you know, funny and bad that's about to happen to the people that tried to fuck with her posthumously. So, um, oh, another theory that kind of like paints Tutmos the third as like not a bad guy is that there was a kind of superstition in ancient Egypt. Like women had a lot of power in ancient Egypt, like daily life. They weren't allowed to be the king because there was a superstition that this one God called Ma'at didn't like it when women were in charge of things. So there is a theory that Tutmos was like, oh, Ma'at might get mad. So we better you know, get rid of these depictions of this lady king. So that's Hatshepsut. Oh, yes. Uh, before we, we can't move on until I'm sure people have like Hatshepsut questions or thoughts or comments. Christina, was there anything in the chat that we want to call out before we go to our next very important poll? Uh, I just wanted to point out Toby and Jenna's theory that Hatshepsut Say it for me. I've been trying all day. Hot chef. Hot chef soot. Hot chef soot. Hot chef soot. Hot chef soot. Shaped holes were from not from uh, carving her likeness out, but from when she busted through walls like the Kool Aid Man. I think that's got to be it. What like, do you think she would have said instead of "Oh yeah"? I don't know what. See, the thing about ancient Egyptian is like we don't really know how it would have sounded spoken. Like we can kind of translated it but we nobody knows exactly how it would have sounded so whatever the ancient Egyptian Egyptian equivalent of oh yeah would have been is what she would have yelled <laughs> but it was scary I didn't know it ended with an Egypt fact out of that that's so cool <laughs> do we have any questions from the chat about Hatch upset uh, <laughs> I I don't see questions but just a lot of uh encouragement for her queen shit uh noticing that uh, this is an incredible compound. We want compounds like this. How do you think it was made? I don't know. People the, carved out rock haven. I have no idea how it was made. I do know that her like lover slash architect had been the architect for the king before and was like, there are people who specifically study this guy. Like he was such a genius. There are people that specifically like Egyptologists who specifically focus on him. But I don't know how he did it. I'm sure that's like an ongoing question. Uh, I noted your use of the phrase, uh, prolific side piece. <laughs> I mean- I'm pretty sure at the, yeah, there's that whole Hatch Upset room at the Met. There's also, I remember seeing, there's a little like eyeliner uh, kit mm -hmm. at the Met as well. And I didn't, I didn't put the pieces together until now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a pioneer in eyeliner. A king and a pioneer in eyeliner. Like, without her, could Prince, the musical artist, exist? No. A good point. A good Coming point. Up. Um, speaking of things existing, Jesus Christ, that was awful. <laughs> um, so we're about to transition very far into the future. We're talking uh, upwards. We're, we're going about 1799. And Christina, I just, I don't know how to make this transition because our timing is all off. So I'm just gonna do the fucking poll. You guys, of these, of these inventions that came out between 1500 and 1700, which is a very random and arbitrary time period now, uh, which is your favorite? Is it glass eyeballs, champagne, the equal sign, a clock with a minute hand, or cheddar cheese, please vote now. These are real inventions that came out between those time periods. Those time periods that we created when we were under the impression <laughs> that ancient yeah. Egypt uh, was way more recent than it was, uh, are bad. Of these, I like best the equal sign. <laughs> Wine and cheese, or champagne and cheese, or oh, nothing. That's true. But cheddar cheese doesn't go with champagne, right? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Does it, I've never tried. Is anyone in the chat? I'm sure people in the chat are going to have very strong feelings about cheddar cheese and champagne together. So please let us know if there's a certain year varietal that pairs best with your favorite Cabot. Is that how they say? Cabot? 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 The Vermont cheddar? C-A-B-O-T? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I think it's Cabot, but also as a person who's from Wisconsin, how dare you besmirch cheddar and imply that it's a Vermont thing? We do hard cheeses better than anyone else. I'm just gonna All say. I said was that particular cheddar is from Vermont. I didn't say anything about its quality, uh, but it did win, cheddar cheese. This, this went how I expected. The <laughs> Dino 101 audience loves, uh, loves a savory treat and they love a beverage. Can't stop that. Yeah. All right, 
You guys, it's time to do some hardcore science. We're moving all the way to 1799. So I want to set the stage for a minute because we haven't really talked too much about like what was going on in the world with respect to paleontology or with respect to dinosaurs at the time of St. Olga or Hatshepsut. So we're going to fast forward all the way to 1799. Now, prior to the 1800s, you guys remember this is barely after um, the idea that animals could go extinct was even in anyone's consciousness. Like at the time, even people in scientific circles still believed the earth, like deep time was not really comprehended yet. Many scientists still thought the earth was only 6,000 years old. Gregor Mendel wouldn't come along with his beans and for another 50 years. And to bring this all up as a preface to, for my money, the most unfuckwithable of all the people we're gonna talk about tonight. You know her, we all love her. This is the one, the only Mary Anning. So Mary Anning, was born in 1799 in Lyme Regis off the Dorset coast in southern part of England. And before we get to why she is unfuckwithable and her tremendous contributions to science and paleontology, um, her life started when at the, well, her life started, she was born in 1799. When she was 15 months old, she was being held by her neighbor, standing under a tree with two other women watching a traveling equestrian show. Storm rolls in, lightning strikes the tree, kills all three of them, except for, including the woman holding Mary. Mary survived. No, I'm not saying it was this like stroke of God that gave her superpowers for fossil finding, but I'm not not saying that either. Now, almost every depiction you see of Mary Anning is in this exact same outfit. I'm not really sure why. Um, every single one, like, Come on, can we have, these are fun, but can we have a couple wardrobe changes? This is my favorite, yay. Um, quick seek and find, you guys, what is the difference between this painting and this one done two years after her death? So this is two years after her death. This is while she was alive. Can you guys tell the difference? There's a little seek and find. This is like highlights magazine. Yeah, can you go, can you go back again? Can you? Boom. Boom. I'm seeing people saying in the chat her ribbon, the dog, she might be looking up in one of them to heaven. Is she pointing at something different? Maybe it's the shoreline. There's a fossil that's different. The ammonite by her feet. You got ammonite? No ammonite. Someone called it a cow pie. Yeah. Also, her dog's name was Trey, like T R A Y. I'm not sure if that was based off of like a tray you carry your fossils around in, but <laughs> really, really cute name. Oh. So, Mary Anning. Uh, so again, before Mary Annie came along, the idea of extinction wasn't really accepted. People didn't know about pretty much every single animal that she would bring to the fore. Over the course of her life, she found and described the very first, where'd it go? There we go. Screen share is not, there we go. She found and described the very first ichthyosaur. This is a drawing that Mary did after uh, it was discovered by her and her brother. Now, I want to mention also that Mary came from what at the time they would call like an unfortunate or pretty poor family. Her father was a cabinet maker and her and her brother would scour the cliffs at Dorset uh, in Lyme Regis. Where'd the picture of them today go? There we go. Um, looking for fossils to sell to tourists to help supplement their family's income, right? So she never went to school for paleontology. She never went to school. She never went to university period because at the time in England, women couldn't vote Women could not go to university and women could not join the, uh, the paleontological or the geological society in London. So during the course of her life, she had actual people from those societies coming from London to study with her and see the things she discovered and learn from her because again, she was finding things people had never seen before, such as our ichthyosaur drawing here, which is based off of the fossil her and her brother found. And this is what we think an ichthyosaur probably looked like, kind of like a chubby dolphin. So she found the first ichthyosaur. This is a drawing Mary did of the very first plesiosaur that anyone ever found. This is another type of marine reptile. This is the drawing she did of this fossil, which is at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, that's my friend Zach. Some of you guys might know Zach. Um, oh, and there's that same drawing one more time. Again, no one ever found anything like these before. And this was one of the first times that anyone was like, oh, wait a minute. These are animals that are absolutely not here today, have no modern corollaries. Maybe God fucked up if we still believe in God and actually let design things that went extinct. The idea of that happening pretty much unheard of before then. Again, this is your plesiosaur, your marine reptile, your dino of the day. We're going to see our gallery of towards the end of our time together. Now we know about, most people know about the plesiosaur she found. If you know about Mary Annie, you know about the ichthyosaur as well, or this is the ichthyosaur, you know about the plesiosaur as well. 
She was the first person to find a, a, a pterosaur, pterodactyl outside of Germany. So she's the first person in England to ever find a flying reptile. And something I learned today, which is freaking badass. She was not for the first person to find a fossilized squid, but she was the first person to find a fossilized squid that was so well preserved, there was still usable ink in its ink sacs. This is a hundred million year old usable ink in this ink sack. So Mary Anning knew exactly what she was doing as a fossil hunter. I will say she lucked out tremendously by living right here because these cliffs at the time, people weren't going here to look for fossils. We didn't know at the time that we were exposing on these cliff sides about a hundred million year old, a hundred to 200 million year old Jurassic age seabeds. So at the time there was a sea or an ocean where this location is now. And we think that it was really anaerobic at the bottom, which allowed for better preservation of these animals that you just saw. I'm not sharing the picture, hold on, there we go. Um, and the other cool thing about this is that this place has a, a fair amount of pretty severe weather. So over the course of literally every time there was a storm, new things would erode away from the cliffs, from the rocks, giving them more and more fodder to go and find. Now, Mary wasn't very celebrated during her life as most of these women were, unfortunately. Um, over the last 15, 20 years or so, I think there's been a lot more fanfare. She has a statue now. She has that uh, the plaque and the description of her actual animal at the Natural History Museum. Uh, the movie Ammonite came out. Has anyone seen Ammonite? Some of you guys, maybe, no one. Uh, but for my money, Christina, I think, and you brought this up earlier, I think the one thing that people know about Mary Anning that aren't even dinosaur people or paleontologists, supposedly, as the legend goes, she is where we got the tongue twister. She sells seashells by the seashore, which is uber cute. I thought you unmuted me because you were gonna make me say it. Oh, do you wanna try? <sighs> Mary Anning sold fossilized sea creatures by the ocean. By the Dorset Cliffs. All right, uh, thanks, Christina. <laughs> we are already behind time, so I'm blasting through these. We're going for one Mary to probably my second favorite paleontological Mary, someone that maybe you guys haven't heard of, uh, isn't quite as prolific, and that is Mary Schweitzer. Mary Schweitzer is a paleontologist who works at the North Carolina State University. Now, I often, as a dinosaur nerd on the internet, get asked, did dino how did dinosaurs have sex? How big was a dinosaur penis? What did it look like? All that jazz. And if you've ever heard me talk about this, you know dinosaurs do not have baculums, which are penis bones. Uh, we'd find them in the fossil record if they did. Uh, so we're pretty sure they had cloacas like modern birds or reptiles, which is basically one hole to rule them all. So one hole for <laughs> the the poop and the sexy time juices come out. Uh, and much like modern birds, and I said that on purpose so we can drink. I'll take this opportunity to address uh, something I'm seeing in the chat. The people love a sex lake. Uh, I think now is a good time for just a quick vocab review. Thanks, thank you. In case you're new to Dino 101 or just love hearing it, uh, a sex lake is a location where, according to one paleontologist, enormous dinosaurs like sauropods, the big long necks, must, must have had to go to have sex because otherwise they would have crushed each other's bones. So the term sex lake, it, it's probably not real but it lives on in our in imaginations. Heart. It lives on in my heart. <laughs> All right, back to dinosaur sex. Um, so Mary Schweitzer, we'll get back to her. Listen, this is her- We never left dinosaur sex. What, <laughs> say it again? I said back to dinosaur sex. I said, we never left dinosaur sex. We never leave, it's always, it's always at the fore. Um, yeah. Here she's holding a dinosaur nut, no. Um, this is Mary <laughs> in the field. And I show this picture because this is an actual working paleontologist who also will go inside on camera, on mic, and make a face like, you want to fuck with me? I just, I love this picture. I just love this picture. Well, why are we talking about her? Why was I bringing up dinosaur sex? Mary Schweitzer was the first person to be able to determine if an extinct dinosaur fossil was a male or a female, right? We, we can look, if we have a ton of different specimens from one species, you can sometimes determine that they may have been sexually dimorphic, males and females, different shapes, different sizes. But if you don't have a lot, that's a lot harder. We don't have a ton of T-Rexes. And so it was very hard for us to tell if a T-Rex that we were looking at was a male or a female until Mary Schweitzer came along and was like, yo, I'm going to examine using thin sections and a microscope the interior of this T-Rex bone. And I'm going to find something that is known as medullary bone. So the MB, that like spongy part, it's known as medullary bone. And in modern birds, medullary bone is a special calcium rich type of uh, 
bone that is laid down when birds are making eggs or they had just laid eggs. So if you find a T-Rex or any dinosaur fossil for that matter, and it has evidence of that same medullary bone, it's a pretty good indication, uh, indication that that not only was a female dinosaur, but it was laying eggs or had just laid eggs at the time of death, which also means we get to look at a pretty cute gravid or pregnant T-Rex. Love these arms from these guys. And that brings us to everyone's second favorite game. Em, I hope you're ready. It is time for the whiteboard challenge. Aaron, I'm going to bring you to the four again, and I'm going to read the name of this game very slowly because it is a long name. It's very complicated. Here we go. I'm such a okay. game. Uh, this is the M draws in front of everyone while the guests were. That's you, uh, not Simone, Aaron. I forgot to change that. Aaron, that's yeah. you. Aaron, that's you. Attempt to figure out what guesswork related topic, word, or phrase M is attempting to digitally render whiteboard challenge. So I have private message M three different clues. She's going to bring up her whiteboard. I'm going to bring up M right now. She's going to share her whiteboard and it, she's going to draw these one after another. Aaron, your job, figure out what she's drawing. Okay. Get some help from the chat. I will also say, Aaron, these aren't like obscure dinosaurs. All this stuff you are familiar with. Okay. Okay, M, take it away. Let's do this. I'm going to attempt to draw over my dog. This is round one. Aaron, uh, 20 points for round one. Okay, how many guesses do I get? Until you get it right or it stops being funny. Infinite. <laughs> okay. Hmm. <laughs> I, I like when I forget what I told you because I'm trying to figure this out as you go. What did I? Oh, okay, okay. Um, I think I, I think I know what this is. Are these runes? Like <laughs> witch runes? Uh, oh, is that? Oh, that's his, my podcast. That's hysteria. That's the <laughs> logo. <laughs> <laughs> they have like play pause forward what what witchcraft is this burn her give us your pitch for hysteria <laughs> um hysteria is the podcast i host we've been uh it's me and Alyssa master monaco who used to be obama uh, barack obama's deputy chief of staff um, and then a rotating cast of women, mostly comedians. Some of them you may have heard of. Uh, Michaela Watkins, one of our regulars. She is uh, currently on CBS's Unicorn and was on uh, SNL. We have Naomi Ek Paragon, who is a, one of the funniest stand-ups working today. She also acts on Mythic Quest and she's been in a bunch of stuff. Um, I really think she's going to take over the world. We also have like Megan Gailey, Grace Parra, Dana Schwartz, who hosts Noble Blood, which is a fun podcast about... Uh, murderous regents which if you guys liked the saint olga story she every single episode of her podcast is about that but it's like just an incredible group of women uh they're all really smart we talk about the news and then we talk about other stuff and then we do a segment called i feel petty which is where we take uh really strong stances on thing that, things that don't matter like i think this week i talked about how i think yellow gatorade is the worst gatorade um one person said she thinks jeans should be abolished not like dna but like things you wear as pants she doesn't she doesn't like them she's done with them um but it's a it's a fun show it's uh we've gotten to interview some cool people like elizabeth warren stacy abrams samantha power uh we have amy klobuchar coming up this week um kirsten gillibrand Maisie hirono uh, ilhan omar we, we get a lot of like really cool female politicians so it's fun if you're into politics news and like women talking to each other without being interrupted by men you should, you'd like hysteria. I love hysteria. That was a great plug for hysteria. Um, oh, before we move to round two, yeah. Aaron, what is your favorite Gatorade flavor then? I don't like Gatorade. If I have to do it, okay, so I used to be a pretty serious distance runner. And the reason I hate yellow Gatorade is because in long races, that's the only flavor they give out is yeah. yellow and it's warm. Yeah, it, yeah. Imagine running you know, yeah. 20 plus miles in the Chicago heat in the you know end of summer, early fall. And they're giving you fucking warm piss colored sugar water. It sucks. If I have to drink Gatorade, I like the red kind, but I just, it's just drink water. You don't need to drink Gatorade. Okay. Yeah, water is the original sports beverage. Um, <laughs> exactly. damn, round two, hit us. I'm, I'm very curious to see how Em's going to try to pull this one off. I am too. Is it a cigarette? 
<laughs> it looks like uh, that really famous bad drawing of a suspect <laughs> by a police sketch artist. Color? Um, okay. Well, I see some classroom newspaper tired robot. Uh, not crooked.com. Good guess. It's not. Uh, oh, yeah. Is it Jezebel? The website? Is it? You're so close. You're on the right it, track. The, the Daily Beast, the there website? It there it is. Uh, I, so I just am I assumed that you would draw like a calendar or something like daily and then like a monster? Monster, yeah. But you're like, no, <laughs> it's simple. So you write yeah. for the Daily Beast, right? That's I why. That's write, why we <laughs> yeah, I do write for the Daily Beast. I'm a multi hyphenate. Um, yeah, I, uh, I started working there full time the first week in October 2016, which was the Monday before the Friday that the Access Hollywood tape came out. I had tickets to go see a concert that night. I had tickets to go see Sigur Rós, which is this like Scandinavian, like ambient, like fun folk. It's loud. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's like fairy music and it's incredible. And I'd never seen them live before. And I was supposed to go see in the Trump tape of him grabbing pussies and talking about it came out. And I had to go on MSNBC and spend the whole night being like, yeah, looks like Donald Trump's really toast. And yeah, that was my first week of working at the Daily Beast. I'm glad that you sunk his political aspirations. Yeah, that did it. That, that got him. <laughs> Screw that guy, uh, formal social media influencer. All right, uh, last but not least, round three, the points are quadrupled, why not? M, hit us. Oh no. Oh boy, okay. Never move. A vase? Oh, I like the color change, nice, that's, that's key, I like that. Uh, Aaron, let me just mention that I am from and grew up in Ohio, that may, Another Midwestern say you'll see. Go ahead. Hmm. Uh, I see it? it in the chat. If you want to turn to the chat for help, they've got you. Oh, is it ranch dressing? It is absolutely <laughs> the Midwest's own ranch dressing. I wanted to bring this up because I'm curious to know if you like ranch, A of all, and B of all, how have people reacted outside of the Midwest when you bring up ranch? Because here in New York, if I even mention it, it's it's like I voted for Trump. <laughs> um, well, I remember I went to college in Indiana and I remember ranch where I did not grow up in a ranch house. I grew up in rural Wisconsin. We didn't do that stuff. So I was like, I went to, I came to, to the University of Notre Dame where I went to undergrad and uh, we would have like dorm meetings where they would order pizza and like ranch would just come on the side. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And all of the people who are like, from Chicago and from Cleveland and all these places were like, yeah, we put ranch on things. I was never on team ranch. It always confused me. I think one time I was really stoned and I dipped some pizza in it and it was good. But generally speaking, I don't, I don't really fuck with ranch anymore. Interesting. Okay. We have some very strong, I should have done a ranch poll, but we didn't. Plus we don't have time. It's already 9.50. So Aaron, I want to like, we're supposed to be done at 10. We always go a little bit over. So we need to pick up the pace for these last few people. Um, including a woman, you know, I'm just, I'm gonna let you take the helm here. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to transition from that to Nancy Pelosi. Does she like ranch? I don't know. I think I'm the only person who can, uh, get you off of your segue game. Also, Aaron, before you get into Nancy, I just want to let you know, I only have two other pictures of her and it is okay. obviously this one and this one. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Uh, so I think that she, because we're living in a time that's like at the same time as she's living, she might be a little bit divisive, but I'm just, I'm just painting her as an unfuck with a bull. I'm not saying Nancy Pelosi is like the best person ever to live. You know, nobody is, people are complicated, but there is no denying that her life has been very impressive. Um, Nancy Pelosi was the youngest of seven children and the only girl. Um, her father was the mayor of Baltimore. She's from a political family. Um, she is the only woman ever to hold the position of Speaker of the House. Uh, do you guys know how old she was when she first ran for office? First time she ran for office. How old? 47. She did not run for any political office until she was 47 years old. Now the woman is in her 80s and she's still wearing like six, six inch stiletto heels. 
Um, she ran for office for the first time in 1987. She was 47 years old. The youngest of her five children had just gone to college. Um, and she ran because the Congresswoman that held the seat in her district was dying and was like, Nancy, please run for my seat after I die. So she died, Nancy won a special election very narrowly. But then as soon as she was in the House of Representatives, she just was off and running. Um, when she was first in the House of Representatives, she was championing issues that were way ahead of their time. She was uh, one of the first people to try to legislatively address the AIDS crisis. She, in 1994, helped push a assault weapons ban, um, which was at the time also very progressive. She has also been one of the leaders in pushing for LGBTQ rights uh, at the national level. Um, she was an architect of the 2006 plan for Democrats to take back the House of Representatives, which was a total long shot, but it ended up working. Uh, and when they took the, the House of Representatives back, she became the first ever female Speaker of the House. Uh, within her first 100 hours of being Speaker, she got the House to raise the minimum wage, enact the 9-11 Commission Report, uh, and end a bunch of tax subsidies to oil companies and make new rules about lobbying within the first 100 hours of her being I'll speaker of the house. That's not even a drinking rule, but I'll drink to that for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the lady works her ass off to an almost scary degree. Um, she also in 2008 got the TARP uh, plan passed. This was when George W. Bush was still the president before Barack Obama. So she was able to get this huge bipartisan package moved through the House of Representatives in a really tough time. She also uh, was the reason that Obamacare was passed. The pr President Obama um, thought that it was too ambitious and he wanted to chop it into small pieces and get them passed piecemeal. But Pelosi was like, nope, we're gonna do this in one big chunk. And she was the reason that it, that it made it all the way through. Obama called her one of the greatest legislators of all time. And I gotta say she and LBJ are two of the, two of the toughest ones. They've both got extreme big dick energy. Um, Nancy Pelosi does not drink coffee and rarely sleeps. Her favorite food is chocolate. She eats chocolate ice cream for breakfast. I know one woman who is a reporter who had breakfast with Pelosi one time and the first time they met, Nancy had a big ass bowl of chocolate ice cream for breakfast. That woman wear, like the shoes she wears, eating ice cream, not drinking coffee and barely sleeping. I would not fuck with Nancy Pelosi if you paid me to fuck with her. Um, she's also done a great job of keeping the Democratic caucus together during, during a tough time. And she's a, she's, a real, she's a real one. She's real unfuckwithable for sure. Oh, yes. Hell yes. All right. We have made it through five out of our six unfuckwithables. Christina, are you ready to take us to our last unfuckwithable, um, which is a fan favorite, of course. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, I can't wait. Uh, this also, I found a very amazing, this is one of the better like stock photos, like profile pics of anyone I've seen. Here we go. Boom. Sue Hendrickson. Sue <laughs> Hendrickson. Hell yeah. Sue <laughs> Oh, thanks, Maggie. Uh, I'll be on next year's Unfuck With the Bulls episode. Uh, this one, we're closing out on Sue Hendrickson. I think we know what Sue is famous for, but let me tell you some things that I learned about Sue that I was like, yeah, of course, but uh, just put that in the Unfuck With the Bull bucket. <laughs> so she started doing paleontology by volunteering over her summers. Uh, she would just go out on digs, but she had a ton of other badass jobs too. She was going on salvage dives. She was an amber miner. She became a paleo-entomologist. She was finding uh, bugs in amber. Uh, she would go on these paleontological digs finding Miocene mammals. And then one summer on a dig that she just invited herself to. I'm going to think of her every time like, do I belong here? Should I go? Yes, you do. Go on that dig because that's when she found the Sue the T-Rex in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The most complete, the best preserved, and the most large and enchored T-Rex ever, ever found. That's how Sue the T-Rex got their name. So there's no way to tell if Sue the T-Rex, the specimen at the Field Museum in Chicago was male or female, whatever. So Sue uh, did lend her name to Sue the T-Rex. Erin, do you follow Sue the T-Rex on Twitter? I don't follow Sue the T-Rex on Twitter. I've heard that, that it's a really good one to follow. I did used to like visit Sue the T-Rex all the time in the museum uh, in Chicago where she, where a replica of her lives. This guy, this lady? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. 
Have you been back since Sue has moved up to their own suite? <gasps> no, it's been a lot. It's been, I lived in Chicago until like 2012. So it's been a while since I've been to that museum, but I got to go back. You remember earlier when I was like, hey, what is the difference between these two Mary Anning pictures? Aaron, I'm going to pick on you now as our nascent paleontologist. Can you notice any difference anatomically between this Sue and the same Sue once they move them upstairs? Any parts of this Sue? Can you go back? Like a gander. Is there some like floating ribs underneath it in the second photo? Boom, look at you. You A plus in Dino 101. Those are known as gastralia. Yeah, they're like ribs on the bottom and they weren't originally mounted on the specimen that was in the main Stanley Field Hall. Mm -hmm. and then when they moved them upstairs. Those were added. Also the shoulders, the arms were moved because they were in an incorrect position where they wouldn't have actually been able to come together. Uh, so Sue got some updates mm -hmm. when they went upstairs. This is the last, I just like this picture. This is a good one too. All right. Um, oh, wait, we have one last poll, don't we, Christina? A very important poll inspired uh, by a lot of stuff, Aaron, that you talk about. So we were just wondering, you know, um, if just if, you know, we had the ability to bring Sue back as an actual living, breathing dinosaur, who should we have Sue the T-Rex eat? Should it be <laughs> Joe Manchin, Mitch McConnell, Ed Cruz, Madison Cawthorn or Candace Owens? Who should we feed to our genetically reintroduced T Rex? <laughs> this is uh, a tough. This is a tough choice. Aaron, do you have a winner here? Oh my God, Mitch McConnell. He is one hundred percent. He is a hundred percent the reason that things are as bad as they are. He made the world worse. And if you know, look, if somebody must be eaten by a T Rex, I think that would be fine. Okay. McConnell is by far winning this poll. We have 83% of the vote and we have very high voter turnout here, by the way. It's about 83% right now. Wow. 87%. Okay. I'm going to end this. This is... Hold up. Uh, Mitch McConnell is currently winning with 69% of the vote. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well done. Well done, Mitch. You finally won something that we made. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, that was our final poll. Let's see. We have, why don't we take, Christine, I know we're over, we're going to be over time anyway, but let's do a couple questions. I'm sure there are some questions for Aaron about, I don't know, whatever. What does the chat want to know before we go into our paleo gallery? <laughs> well, uh, time isn't real, keeping track of it. Also People true. made it up so we can be done whenever we want. Uh, send your questions that you want me to send along to Aaron or about the paleontology we came up with uh, as we go through the chat. Uh, so regarding Mary Anning, she found fossils, but the idea of extinction wasn't really a thing. So what information were they looking for in fossils? Why were fossils useful? Or did that sort of turn this anti-extinction idea on its head or lack of extinction idea? No one ever found these. So the question is like, what are we, what are they looking for when they're looking for fossils? Is that the question? Like I'm not well, exactly. what is the value of finding a fossil in a world where you extinction isn't on your radar? Great. Okay, I see what you're saying. Because you're able, you then be, you start to be able to paint a picture and connections between life now and life as it used to be, and the idea that not everything here is going to be here permanently forever. And I think it's important to like have people recognize, oh, we are stewards and shepherds of this planet and all the things that live upon it, and. Beyond that, just the idea of finding things no one has ever seen before that have no modern correlation, it, it engenders like a certain uh, fascination and mysticism with science and what's actually possible in the natural world. This is a drawing that someone, a man did, came and visited with Mary and then did this lithograph based on her fossils and her drawings. And remember all the things in this, no one had ever seen before. Like no one had seen any of these animals before. Can you then imagine going to a museum and seeing this image and seeing the actual fossils of creatures the likes of which has, haven't been here for millions of years? I, I mean, I think in of itself, just that exploratory nature speaks to why we do science in the first place. Um, and yeah, I mean, that'd be my easiest answer for that. I was already sold on paleontology and I bought it again from you. Uh, Aaron, uh, what is an obstacle you've encountered as a woman in media that you might like to share with us? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, 
one thing that kind of is noteworthy i've i've worked in mostly female spaces most of the time except when i've been in tv writer rooms those are mostly male like it's always sunny in philadelphia is about half female and half male so it's not as dude as you would think but it's not a female space because all the head writers are guys that has never presented any challenges to me whatsoever uh the times that i guess like when i worked at jezebel um, we were under the Gawker Media umbrella. So like there was a bunch of other titles like Gizmodo was part of the same company. They worked like I could throw shit at the people who worked at Gizmodo. Jalopnik, you know, uh, Deadspin, Gawker, like there were all these other places and a lot of them had really like dudely kind of reputations. And the people I worked with were really great. But one thing I noticed that happened sometimes was we had like when tips would come in, general tips, if a story was a big story, it would always go to Gawker. Like, even if it was something that we covered, even if it was something that we were like, we have been talking about this, this is totally in our wheelhouse. If it was a story that had the potential to be like national, it just was like assumed that the general interest, like mostly male staffed blog would be the one to cover it. But I think generally speaking, um, we're like, I've had good luck. Um, people have been pretty nice to me and I haven't had like, you know, a terrible time. Uh, Sometimes I have found that like, you know, you'll pitch a story and I'll be like, I, I, this is going to be important. This is an important story. And you'll have to kind of fight to get it, like your pitch taken. And then once it's taken, the story like ends up blowing up and you end up being like, okay, maybe my editor will learn from this, uh, that I have some insight into what matters to some of our readers, namely like female readers. But it feels like sometimes a little bit of a hamster wheel, like every single time you have to make the case again and again for why a subject would be interesting, even though you've already proven that it is interesting. So those are just minor annoyances. So generally speaking, my my time has been good. Some familiar annoyances, uh, annoying nonetheless. Mm -hmm. uh, other than our new favorite, Olga, do you have another favorite historical, take a sip, woman of all time? Oh, historical woman of all time. Um, I I like Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was really unfuckwithable and badass. If you don't know very much about her, I would read read up on her. She was just like a fearless journalist writing uh, anti-segregation, anti-slavery stuff at a time when that was like actually dangerous. She also uh, was involved in the suffrage movement in America. And like she was like, it was hard enough to be like a black man trying to write stuff. But she was like a black woman running a newspaper in a place where it wasn't safe. And she wrote, she was a great writer, a great speaker, and a really important advocate. And I, without her, the movement would have been, it would have taken a lot longer in order for it to get pushed forward, I think. Thank you, Jesse. Are we good, Christina? Are we ready for our paleo gallery? It is time. Okay, so I just got a phone call. Hello. <laughs> Who's calling me that doesn't know I'm doing this right now? Um, Aaron, have you been to a museum recently? No, because everything is closed. I would love to go to a museum, but I, I like haven't been to one. Okay. Well, you're in luck because this is going to be better than that. All right, guys, we're going to show our Paleo Art Gallery. So I'm going to highlight your screen and us. Uh, we're going to do the Waldorf and Statler thing at what I'm sure is going to be your very beautiful drawings. We'll start with Laurel. Oh, it's a plesiosaur. Okay. Okay. Oh. oh, it's having some some beach vices. It's got it's got it smoking weed <laughs> and gambling. It's smoking <laughs> weed and gambling and drinking on the okay. All right. I all love right. a beach vice. <laughs> That's I, I like this one. I'm not against that at all. I'm ready. This makes me want to go to the beach. Uh all right, Agus. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, wow. you're in trouble. <laughs> Motherfucker. I had the chat over motherfucker. I wasn't intentionally censoring myself. I thought it was a wholesome surprise. Where's that going to go on the gallery behind you, the posted gallery? New, <laughs> new frame. New frame. All right. Uh, Christine. Oh, I like this one. Oh, what a nice sandcastle. This, this plesiosaur is on its way to be like, hey, good job on that sandcastle. <laughs> I think he's wearing a pirate hat too. Ooh. Oh, riding it, okay. Oh. Ooh. They are friends. This one looks happy. It just looks like a very happy plesiosaur. Um, the next one, I, I guarantee we'll have a top hat 
Yep, there it is. <laughs> He's a small boy. Small boy. Oh. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, okay. This, this is, I like this. That's beautiful. You're so you're so uh, salt water scrunched, just enjoying the sun. Wow. I feel like I feel the sun on my face in this picture. You guys, reminder, please put these on Instagram, Twitter, tag us so we can see them and reshare them because they, <laughs> wow, wow, <laughs> wow. Wow, that's. This, it might be over for everyone else. <laughs> wow. It's over for you, like, this is the way. It the nostalgia of bones, kind of. It's great. No, it's really, really. Oh, we have another digital one here. I like the safety first. Okay, okay. Always good. Safety first at the sex lake, always. <laughs> Bring some protection. I like the idea of an animal that's that's evolved over millions of years in the in the sea and also needs floaties. That's I like that. Oh. I like that. Safety first, kids. More floaties. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like Michael age 52. <laughs> He's a star Thanks, student. Michael. Michael's there drinking Mountain Dew every week. Ooh, oh, see, helpful with the, the sunscreen. I like this. Oh, I, that's so nice. I have a plesiosaur. Make sure they get under the straps because that's where you'll get sunburn. Tell them. I, plesiosaur knows. I don't know. <laughs> Beach, please. <laughs> that's technically like a dad joke pun thing. So I'll drink to that. That's good. That's good. Oh, we've got a few more. All right, we're going to Tony. I think I see some other seat. Are you in a da, 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 da. <laughs> I like the other animals. Are those like jellyfish, maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Jada, the best shark expert on Twitter. If you don't follow Jada on everywhere, you should. Uh, we're going to you, Jada. Oh, nice. I, the way that, that it's splayed out flat is making me uncomfortable. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with a plesiosaur being proud of its body. Clearly, it's been doing a lot of work on its pecs and abs. It has like a 16 pack. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, is that our last drawing? Oh, no, no. We got, I'm no sorry. Way. No, definitely not. Sorry. All right, Ryan. Ryan, plesiosurfing. Yeehaw. Oh, that's nice. I like that. I like that at the Jurassic Amusement Park. Wow, that's that's the next iteration is the dinos are the rides. That couldn't possibly end badly. Yeah. No sun, no sand, no h no no prob. No prob. I love these teeth. Yeah, I like yeah. the detail. We didn't talk about one of the other things that we knew this wasn't like related to sharks or anything is please these sorts of conical teeth. They're not shaped like shark teeth. They're conical. And so it was like, wait, this is nothing like the things we see today. Wow, like bugles. Do you think like, they would get bugles stuck on their teeth if they got, like, if they bit into the hole? I think they'd dissolve in their spit, probably. That's good. That's Ooh, sex okay. lake. Here we go. <laughs> Salty sex <laughs> lake. Oh. Oh, I like the volleyball. That's nice. That's good. With the bull human. This is making me want to go to the beach more than I thought it was going to. <laughs> wow, you guys are so good. Whoa. These are great. These are I like the sunglasses on the plesiosaur is really winning me over. Oh, it's a little umbrella drink. Oh, two sunglasses. Oh, and it's thinking of pizza. Sunburn. Thank you for pointing out the sunburn. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, on the zinc nose. Yeah. Please, you guys upload these, tag us. They're great. I'll drop our handles again. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I feel like five minutes from now, this would evolve into a sex lake scene between the plesiosaur and the uh yeah, 100 percent hundo p they always say squid and the plesiosaur can't stay just friends <laughs> oh it's it's a land and sea volleyball yeah, i'd like okay. that the, where the water is would be this ever-shifting net mm -hmm. okay so we went to the movies not to the beach that's okay it's fine. Oh, it's to straight to the movies. Be where you like to be. You know, that's going to be the most, that's going to be more fun than a beach this summer to just have them open again and be able to go. Everybody's got their 
Fauci ouchies, then, you know. It's going to be great. Oh, I like this. I like the minimalism, the charcoal sketch here. Beautiful. Into it. This looks like early morning before any humans hit the beach. It's yep. a moment of zen for the plesiosaur. It looks like the morning after you and the plesiosaur broke up and the plesiosaur is like rolling over in bed and is like, oh, she's not there anymore. Oh, that's one more sad. Yeah, this is the plesiosaur <laughs> version of staring out like a window into the rain. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. I'm going to think about this all the time. I'm going to think about it all the time too. Oh my God. I yes. love its gum to tooth ratio. Oh, look at this Oh, I love that. Does it got does it have like a starfish friend or is it a person on it? Either way, I'm for friend. it. We have more and better drawings than I think we've had in a long time. This is see, this is this is my style right here. This is what I would produce. This looks good. I like this. I'm and into it. Is that, a, for friend? is that a tent? It's a, is it a mountain in the water? It's a beach umbrella. Oh, oh, beach. I, I'm into it. We clearly have not been to the beach in a while. Beach party. Beach party. We got a curly straw. We got a curly neck. It's got everything. I think. I think that's all of them. If you have not shown yours, please hold it up now or forever. Don't hold it up. Put our handles in the chat one more time. We love to be your internet friend. Uh, if you put your drawings on the internet, tag us. We'll love on them repeatedly. All right. So you guys, we are obviously over time per usual. Uh, before we say. Goodbye to everyone. I'm gonna where'd Aaron go? I'm gonna try to find you in the gallery. I've lost you, Aaron. There you are. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm gonna bring you up here as well as Christina. Aaron, do you have any final last words before we bid everyone to do? First of all, thank you so much for coming. This has been great. I have people I need to research now. <laughs> I know there's so many good like Wikipedia dives. Like pandemic has really emphasized the importance of that. I guess like last words. Um, if you want to do some, oh, here's some unfuck withables I didn't get to. But if you really want to have a fun like Wikipedia dive night, uh, there were a lot of female spies during World War II who just fucked with Nazis. And it is so fun to read about them because a lot of the articles that are linked in the Wikipedia articles link to them like, like their obituaries. So it's like these women who are like 95 years old and they died. So you see pictures of them as little old ladies and you see pictures of them as like these fetching, incredible, brave femme fatales. And it's so fun to read about them. Love it. Aaron, thank you once again for being here. Christina, do you have any final last words before we say bye to all of our friends here at Dino 101? Sometimes as a geologist, I forget to zoom in on this little piece of time that humans have inhabited this rock because there are some incredible human beings I need to slow down and spend some time on reveling in. Uh, so hell yeah, thank you, Aaron, for being here and for my next uh, Wikipedia rabbit holes. Right. And I'm so happy everyone that you decided to share this little slice of history with us tonight. You did that eventually so we could drink. Aww. Hell yeah. All right, you guys, last thing, last orders of business. Uh, next week, if you are on Twitter, you may know that birds versus fish is kind of a thing. So next week, we're going to do a Jurassic Park edition with Dr. Solomon R. David, who is a huge fish fan and probably someone who makes somehow more bad puns and dad jokes than I do. We're going to have the official bird versus fish pun off next week here in Dino 101. Also, remember, totally unconnected to Atlas Obscura. We do an after party immediately after this. If you want the link to that, slide into my DMs on Instagram or Twitter. I will send you the link. It's the same link as last week if you already have it. But for now, I don't care if you are asking questions, searching for dinosaurs, or digging deep, deep into the It's Always in Sunny in Philadelphia archives to find my favorite episode, which is when Dee and Charlie get progressively more strung out on steroids and you have the best montage in sports history. Never stop digging. I love all of you guys, but not as much as dinosaurs. We'll see you next Friday. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Quack, 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 quack,